Good day, everyone, and welcome to the second of the week's lectures on smallpox and Native American medicine. In our last lecture, we talked about the reasons this disease proved so fatal to the indigenous inhabitants of the New World, and how it facilitated European colonization of the Americas. We also learned that, despite the devastation this disease wrought, Native Americans did not sit by passively and let it wipe them out. Instead, they took action. But what exactly did they do? And how effective were their attempts to cure those infected with smallpox and stop the spread of the virus? Those are the things we're going to address in this lecture, and we're going to do so by focusing on a single Native American tribe, the Cherokee. So who were the Cherokee? For hundreds of years prior to the arrival of European colonizers in North America, the Cherokee lived in a part of the modern-day United States that extends from North Carolina into South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and parts of Alabama. They were a sedentary people who lived in permanent villages and had a matrilineal social organization, meaning that kinship was traced through the mother's line and that the usual residence of a household included a woman, her husband, her daughters and their husbands, her daughter's children, and any unmarried sons. They practiced a mixed subsistence strategy that gave them a balanced diet of meat, corn, and other vegetables. By the early 1600s, they numbered about 30,000 and were one of the most powerful Indian nations of the Southeast. Because of their position within the rugged terrain of the Appalachian Mountains, the Cherokee were relatively isolated, both from other tribes and from Europeans. This situation lasted until around 1670, when the English established the colonies of South Carolina and Georgia. From the very beginning, the prosperity of these colonies was built on slave labor, but instead of taking slaves themselves, the English obtained these from trade with Native Americans, who exchanged captured slaves for guns, ammunition, alcohol, and other desirable goods. The slave trading network created by the English set the stage for an explosion of smallpox throughout Appalachia. Why was this? Mostly because the slave trade encouraged indigenous tribes to go to war against each other in order to obtain captives for sale to the English. As one of the most powerful tribes in the region, the Cherokee were key players in the slave trade and, by the 1690s, they had been fully integrated into a large trade network that linked them not just to English colonies, but also to the broader Atlantic world, through which guns, captives, and goods moved freely. So too did smallpox. In 1696, the disease broke out in Virginia, and before very long, it proceeded down the southern coast and into the interior. Historians call this the Great Southeastern Smallpox Epidemic. Natives died in droves, as you can see from the excerpt on the screen in which an Englishman reports on the disease's impact on indigenous communities. It's not entirely clear how many lives were lost in the Cherokees' first encounter with smallpox. Unfortunately, it would not be their last. By 1738, they'd experienced another outbreak of the disease, and a third would come in 1759 and 60. Collectively, these successive epidemics brought drastic depopulation. However, many Cherokee survived. What kinds of medical responses did they mount to this frightful new malady? And how effective were these? For a long time, historians have assumed that the Cherokee were effectively paralyzed by smallpox and that it induced a panic that led to destructive, deadly behaviors like suicide. But these arguments are based on sources that were likely biased against Native Americans, like the English colonist James Adair's 1775 book, The History of the American Indians. Today, Historians are increasingly skeptical of ethnocentric accounts like these, and they recognize that much like Europeans encountering syphilis for the first time, the Cherokee placed smallpox within the context of their own medical beliefs, 
and relied on traditional therapeutic and preventive measures to cure the disease and reduce its spread. So what kinds of beliefs and practices and healers made up their medical world? What was Cherokee ethnomedicine like? For the most part, it appears that medicine was a hereditary occupation in Cherokee communities. Knowledge of the medical art passed down through family lineages, and healers generally held a rather high status. Indeed, they ranked among the leaders of the Cherokee nation, and were at the same social level as religious officials, war chiefs, or political leaders. Part of the reason they held such great power was because their activities were believed to be vital to the community's survival. Over the course of the year, Cherokee healers conducted communal rites and rituals connected to hunting, farming, warfare, and health. One of the most important of these was a service called Atovna. Lasting four days, the goal of the ceremony was to purify the bodies of Cherokee men, women, and children. It began with the communal consumption of medicine, which healers prepared in a large pot filled with water and an array of medicinal barks, twigs, roots, and sprigs. People both drank of this sacred beverage and washed themselves thoroughly in it. After consuming the medicine, Cherokees underwent further purification through the going to water rite, during which everyone plunged themselves into a stream seven times. This procedure was thought to cleanse the body and mind of filth and evil. In these ceremonies, healers mediated with the spirit world, and as this suggests, Cherokee medicine had a supernatural basis. According to Cherokee cosmology, the universe consisted not just of physical beings, but also an upper and a lower world where a variety of spirits lived. None of these spirits were inherently good or evil, but some could inflict sickness on people. And when this happened, Cherokee medical practitioners used dreams, omens, and divination to find out which spirits had made their patients ill. The goal of these procedures was to enlist the aid of those spirits that could be helpful against the ones that caused the disease. And here, the rule of opposites prevailed. For example, if a patient was crippled, doctors would seek out bark from a tree that had been broken but continued to grow. Or if a patient was suffering from chills, doctors would search out a warming therapy, waving their remedies over a fire and harnessing the power of the sun spirit. It was into this world of spiritual medicine that smallpox emerged. Though this was unlike anything the Cherokee had ever seen before, they fit it into their pre-existing disease concepts. Doctors associated it with the thunder spirits of the upper world and interpreted smallpox as a consequence of the Cherokee's failure to properly adhere to the rites associated with major festivals like Atovna. And because of this, they responded to smallpox with traditional remedies like the going to water rite. In counseling the sick to submerge themselves in cold water, Cherokee healers hoped to appeal to the spirit world, and in particular, to a spirit called the Long Man, whom it was hoped would take away the sickness and cleanse the body of the evil spirits that had invaded it. European colonists were critical of this cold treatment, but in truth, it was probably better than their own therapies for smallpox, which consisted largely of warm remedies that likely only increased patients' body temperatures and hastened death. Cooling a patient might have actually saved lives. And so too might have other responses to smallpox. Among other things, we know that the Cherokee practiced quarantine, secluding the sick in special houses far removed from the center of their villages. They did this not because they believed in contagion, but as a way of showing respect to the spirit world and in the hopes of restoring cosmic balance. Regardless, the practice slowed the disease's spread and gave the Cherokee time to undertake other kinds of tasks necessary for their survival. 
The Cherokee also invented new means of fighting the disease. One was a preventive measure known as the smallpox ceremony. The goal of this was to bring countervailing spirits into action against those that sent the pox. Like the Atovna ceremony, this revolved around the mass ingestion of communal medicine. During the ritual, healers prayed to a deity from the upper world called Kvatsaka, who was believed to have the power to take the disease away. The ceremony lasted seven days, and during it, participants were forbidden from engaging in long-distance travel. This procedure likely also protected the Cherokee from smallpox. Indeed, the entire festival functioned as a form of quarantine, with villages shut off from the outside world and prohibitions on travel. The smallpox ceremony shows that instead of responding to the new disease with panic and fatalism, Cherokees used it to build community solidarity and preserve their numbers. As a result of these practices, by the 1750s, the Cherokees were on the road to recovery. Though thousands died during the epidemics of 1698 and 1738, those that survived possessed immunity against smallpox, and this prevented further flare-ups of the disease. Unfortunately, however, a third epidemic broke out in 1759, when the governor of South Carolina invaded the Cherokee homeland. By the time the Anglo-Cherokee War of 1759 to 1761 came to an end, the Cherokee had been greatly depopulated. By 1762, the Cherokee population was down to about 7,000. But after this, another demographic rebound occurred. This continued into the 1770s and 80s and was hastened by Cherokee leaders' decision to stay on the sidelines during much of the American Revolution. In the decades following the Revolutionary War, the Cherokee Nation experienced another resurgence. By 1809, their numbers had climbed to around 14,000. Increasingly, the Cherokee Nation survived by incorporating displaced Indians from other nearby tribes and by intermarrying with Euro-American settlers. This made the tribe not only more numerous, but also more culturally diverse. As their exposure to European culture grew, Cherokees became curious to see what the English had to offer them in terms of medical treatments. It was in this context that the smallpox vaccine came to Native Americans. The origins of vaccination date to the mid-1700s, when the Scottish doctor Edward Jenner began experimenting with inoculations of cowpox infection. He did this after noticing that dairy maids and others who contracted this bovine illness never came down with smallpox, even when directly exposed to it. In 1770, Jenner began injecting patients with cowpox in order to test his theories, and in 1798, he published his results. Shortly after this, a number of countries around the world began adopting Jenner's practice of inoculating people with cowpox, and this included the Cherokees. The first known vaccination of a Cherokee person occurred in 1806. During the next two decades, individual Cherokees readily sought out cowpox and administered it to themselves and their families. When a major outbreak threatened their communities in 1824, native leaders turned to the vaccine. However, earlier preventive methods were not abandoned. The smallpox ceremony was also performed. As this suggests, the Cherokee had a very pluralistic medical culture. Their acceptance of an old-world medical preventive did not come at the expense of the abandonment of their traditional practices. But all of this made the Cherokee Nation even more resilient in the face of smallpox. Okay, so that wraps up this lecture. For our next discussion, we're going to read an article about how other Native American tribes responded to smallpox. I've sent out some questions by email to go along with this. Please read these, and when you've got some thoughts to share, you can head over to the discussion board and we'll get the conversation going. Looking forward to joining in with you as we continue our exploration of historical ethnomedicines.